They can devour an entire horse overnight, eating everything but the iron shoes. Sounds like they're coming out of the barrels of hell. Yes. That's why they're called devils. Devils have fascinated scientists for hundreds of years. <laughs> they just get in bad moods sometimes. Nothing you can do about it. You can't talk them around. The wilderness forest of Tasmania shelter the last remaining populations of Tasmanian devils, the largest marsupial hunters alive today. A four-year-old female devil comes out of her den. Her name is Manganini. Her life will be short. Like the kangaroo, she has a pouch. But unlike it, she's a hunter. And the ruse know it. She tests the response of a kangaroo. She's looking for the sick and the weak. The devil's a meat eater, a scavenger with an extraordinary sense of smell. They are solitary animals, except when the neighbourhood gathers to share food. She can smell a carcass from far off. Their Latin name, Sarcophilus, means flesh lover. With jaws like hydraulic presses, they leave nothing behind. Gorged on kangaroo, Manganini returns to her den. It's only weeks since her last litter left home, and already it's time to mate again. A young male gets a whiff of the telltale scent she's giving off. But he knows he's not the only one around. The big man of the area has got there first. He's stronger and more experienced. And he'll be the first caller. He's been here before. He fathered some of Manganini's pups last season. The hormone-driven teenager can't help himself. Female scent is overpowering. He creeps in, even though he knows the bedroom is occupied. can weigh up to 14 kilos. Scarred faces tell of previous battles. This time, the big fellow drives the youngster off. It takes enormous energy, and even the victor will lose a quarter of his body weight during the mating season and the fighting is only part of it. Manganini comes out to see who's won. She knows that smell, as she thought, Mr. Big. His size and age proves he's a survivor and of good stock. But is he still up to it? Now he has to prove himself by overcoming the female as well. It's another test to see if he's fit to sire her pups. But it's a surprisingly tender ritual. Manganini could drive him off if she wanted to, 
and at other times of the year she would. But she's ready, and he's affectionate, and experienced. Not like some of the youngsters. He grabs her by a curious swelling on the back of her neck. She's been building this up for several weeks, just for this purpose. Now it becomes a fleshy handle by which he can drag her, caveman style, to the den. Inside, the wrestling continues until Manganini relaxes. The male will keep her imprisoned here for several days, mating many times and for hours on end. His aim is to secure his paternity by flooding her with sperm. Her aim is to get away and mate with other males. Manganini waits her chance. She tries to get away. The young male can hear what's happening inside. He might still have a chance. Finally, she escapes. Beyond the wilderness and far from Manganini's mountain retreat, the secrets behind the way Tasmanian devils breed are gradually being revealed by an ingenious experiment. Trawana Wildlife Park holds the largest population of captive devils in the world. Biologist Mena Jones has been studying devils and other carnivorous mammals for almost two decades. She's investigating the mysteries of how female devils choose a mate. This is just lovely down here. Everywhere you look, there's a, there's a face grumbling. <laughs> She's actually quiet enough just to hold. The captive devils are coming into season, and Mena checks their breeding state for her experiments. As they get closer to coming into season, they start to produce a pink sort of wax in the pouch, and this builds up into a red, oily secretion. Stop it. Look at that. Here's another girl. Men has constructed three interconnected pens holding two males and a female. The female is fitted with a magnetic key that allows her to enter either of the male zones, but the males can't get to her. She has to choose. You're a bit nice devil in the thinner. She's just running around exploring the enclosure. Kimberly, the female, has the centre pen all to herself. The pen on the right contains Murchison, an older male, and on the left is a young devil, Mac. Mac is excited by the prospect. Kimberly checks out the talent. Mac is not quite sure how to proceed. He's frightened of her. And he's not wrong. But he gives it a shot anyway. The kid just doesn't know what he's supposed to do. The female is totally in control of the situation. Kimberly gives up in disgust and goes home. She tries the other side. That's more like it. When the male grabs her and subdues her, she can choose to fight or she can choose to be dragged and very often she will just lie down and almost invite the male to drag her along the ground. 
that was a real classic because he dragged her on her side for a full two metres and that's about the furthest I've ever seen him dragged. What I found out was that females actually like to mate with older devils and with bigger devils. Bigger devils are, are stronger, they're fitter, they're more dominant and um, older devils have more experience. They've got to be smarter if they've managed to get to that age. There must be something about that feeling of being dominated by the male that makes the females go very placid. They must like it. <laughs> in captivity, Murchison's fatherhood is unchallenged. But in the wild, Mena thinks that females may store sperm from several males before the eggs are fertilised. It's the female's way of upping her chances of having at least one strong offspring. Autumn in the Tasmanian wilderness, and Manganini gathers nesting material. It's only 10 days since Manganini conceived, but already it's time to get the den in order. As the time of birth approaches, she anxiously tries to find the right position. Eventually, she braces herself firmly with her head down a critical position if the birth is to be successful. Contractions begin and she starts to push. Finally, drops of thick fluid begin to emerge, forming silver trails along her fur and leading to the pouch. She's in an almost trance-like state, and this helps her stay in position. The fluid becomes a thin stream of mucus. And within this stream are the tiny living babies, each no bigger than a grain of rice. Each will struggle to climb back up the liquid column to reach the mother's fur. She gives birth to up to 40 of these tiny creatures. An incredibly difficult climb, then a struggle through a forest of hares. The goal is to reach one of the teats in the pouch. It's a life and death race. Because there are only four teats, only four babies can survive. In Manganini's case, only three make it. All are boys. They grow quickly. 30 days later, her boys have developed fine sets of whiskers and their noses start to change color. Teeth and claws are coming along nicely too. but the pouch is getting a bit crowded. With the three pups tucked away on board, Manganini plods off on a nocturnal hunting expedition. She knows where all the game is. Every inch of her home range is familiar. On most nights, she covers about 15 kilometers in search of food. When the joeys leave the pouch, it's a signal to the mob that the female kangaroos are getting ready to mate again. The forest reeks of sex. Echidnas are coming into season two. But for now, she's more interested in finding some nice ant eggs. As with devils, every male kangaroo must prove he's a contender. 
by oiling up and shaping up. The trick here is to avoid getting your eyes gouged. The bouts continue until the strongest eliminates all challenges. But, like an old devil, he'll only hold the crown for a couple of seasons. This bloke is throwing in the towel. The victor politely pays his respects to a female. As with devils, her scent tells him when she's ready to mate. Manganini emerges from an old wombat hole. She's driven by her stomach and led by her nose. Unlike Manganini, the kangaroos are social animals. The mob gives them some protection. Her nose and their reactions tell her if any are weak or old. But these are all too sprightly. Up until 500 years ago, devils also roamed mainland Australia. It's only because Tasmania is cut off by the ocean that devils have survived at all. This is their last stronghold. Manganini's hunting range extends beyond the forest into the cultivated valley below. Devils have benefited from European settlement. Long ago, they came to realise that farms are good places to forage for food. Manganini makes this a regular stop. Devils enjoy scavenging under houses. They'll happily use a secure place like this as one of their dens. Devils are very methodical. And opportunistic. Devils are completely open-minded when it comes to food. They've been found with all sorts of strange things in their stomachs. Steel pot scrubbers, old rubber thongs and even the head of a tiger snake. They've got industrial strength digestive systems. But agricultural machinery might be too much of a challenge. Children were once told scary tales about the terrifying devils that would come out of the forest and eat anything they found, including them. Tales of pets mysteriously disappearing, of the dog chain being all that was left of the family dog. A devil, they were told, got it in the night. But are these just tall stories? Manganini settles for the cat food. The fact is that the dog would be more than a match for a devil. What's going on here? Farmers used to kill devils. They blamed them for losses of young lambs. They so ruthlessly trapped its larger cousin, the Tasmanian tiger, that it became extinct. Since 1941, all devils have been protected, but some farmers are still wary of them. And so are some lambs. But a dead one is fair game.
Most farmers now accept that devils serve a useful purpose by cleaning up animal carcasses and reduce the risk of flyborne diseases. Humans and devils now coexist fairly peacefully. A devil can reach 35 kilometres an hour in short bursts, but Manganini is carrying a full load. Having been out all night, all she wants to do is sleep all day. But the boys have other ideas. Only a few days ago, their eyes opened and they came out of the pouch for the first time. And already, all they want to do is play. <laughs> At three months old, they already have a vocabulary of insistent calls. A handful for a single mother. As winter approaches, the cold Antarctic air rolls in from the south. Far from Manganini's home range and high up in the cloud-covered ranges of central Tasmania lies Cradle Mountain. It was here, 15 years ago, that Mena Jones began her groundbreaking study of devils and the other marsupial carnivores. I had traps spread over 20 square kilometres, half of which I backpacked in, and I used to walk 15 kilometres a day. And I was able to find out that the devils mostly used uh, forested habitats that were fairly open underneath that would help them to hunt because they need to run very long distances. I was out of doors 16 hours a day, frequent snow in winter, but it wasn't dry snow, it was wet snow that fell down the back of your neck and soaked you to the skin. The devil isn't comfortable in the snow either, but it must continue hunting in all weather. With its small feet and heavy weight, the going is tough. The eastern quoll, smaller cousin of the devil, also formed part of Mena's initial research. She discovered that quolls are very active hunters, even in snow. A much larger brush-tailed possum is wary of them. The dainty quoll kills with a crushing bite to the skull or upper neck. Mena's study area included tourist resorts and she found the native animals regard buildings as just part of the landscape. The wombat knows it's warm under the chalet and there's the possibility of a free lunch. The bold little quoll, another opportunistic feeder, has the same idea. Like devils, quolls are highly intelligent and will take advantage of whatever luxuries humans provide. Quolls and devils are found right across the rugged island, from the mountains of the central plateau to the sea. As Mena's fascination with these marsupial carnivores became an obsession, she looked for an area where she could do a long-term study on her beloved devils. She chose Freysenay Peninsula, an isolated wilderness on the east coast where the climate's mild and there's lots of devils. I've always had a dream of doing a very long-term study of devils where I can follow through 10 or 20 generations of animals and uh, follow particular family lines through and particular personality traits and find out who the successful families are, who the successful fathers are and how this is carried on into their, their kids and their grandkids. It might take another generation of biologists to complete the ambitious 50-year project. 
But Mena already has that in hand. There's plenty of small loads still to come. Her passion for Tasmanian devils is such that not even the arrival of baby Mungo has been allowed to interrupt her fieldwork. Hello, little munchkin. Can you give me a smile? Give me a smile? Give me. Ah. Is that a good angle, Joe? Or should I come over this way a bit? Every day, Mena and her helper set off to check the traps. For the last five years, she's been tracking the entire population of devils on the peninsula. The study area is 200 square kilometres, and there's a population of about 150 devils. I trap that entire area once a year in June and July, when females have large pouch young. I can catch most of the youngsters that are going to be produced that year and take genetic samples from them and work out who all the fathers of every litter are. By radio tracking devils on the peninsula, Mena has built up a detailed picture of their daily routine. She discovered they'll even scavenge along the beach. Capable swimmers if necessary, devils are not afraid of the water if it means finding a dead fish or seabird. but they prefer to hunt inland, where there's more game. And the meals are larger. Mena has found that in the breeding season, males range further than normal, a way to increase their chances of finding a female or a meal. Night falls, the humans go inside, turn the lights on, pull the shutters, shut out the outside world, that alien nighttime world out of doors. <laughs> Mungo's adapted very well to this. He's now eight weeks old and he's on his third trip out here. He'll just go to sleep and be carried along. He's nice and snug and warm until you stop, and then he wakes up. And then there's a whole soap opera of animal life starting up in the bush. A spotted tailed quoll, it's the most ferocious of the marsupial carnivores. Although much smaller than a devil, it can kill prey five times its own weight. It could easily kill this possum if it could catch it. The quoll shares the same range as the devil and directly competes with it for food. The quoll isn't scared of a young devil. It's no match for an older one. <laughs> Devils are not delicate eaters. A devil can consume the equivalent of 40% of its own weight in one meal. This is like a human being eating a 25 kilo steak at a single sitting. Devils eat bones and tough skin and the crunching noises of a devil feeding on a carcass can be heard from a very long distance by other devils. So it's very difficult for even a, a lone feeding devil to keep the carcass a secret. In fact, feeding on a carcass is a very social affair. Despite what it sounds like, this is dinner time conversation. The grunt snorts and screams communicate information as well as emotions. Fighting actually helps dismember the body. Devils 
live in the fast lane. Men at Track 1 male are clocked up 50 kilometres in a single night. This one is heading to a favourite spot. The rubbish tip is one of the social centres of devil life on the Freysenay Peninsula. Everybody but everybody gets trapped at the tip sooner or later. It's their midnight cappuccino stop, cream cakes, all the unhealthy things. When they're tired of eating polyunsaturated wallaby, they can go and fill up on real fat, leftover pizzas. When the bins are only half full, the devils get trapped inside and Mena makes regular stops at the tip to help get them out. So it's worth the while for a devil to commute 20 kilometres to the Coles Bay tip. To have that special night out at the Coles Bay tip restaurant. Mena checks the traps along the whole length of the peninsula. DNA samples enable her to identify devils at every stage of their lives. This well, if you come down. She knows each devil personally. This is female 259, a three-year-old that had her first litter last year. There's three tails sticking out of the pouch, actually. See there? When the pups get really big, you can sometimes have three or four tails dangling out as, as she walks away. Female devils can have up to four pups at a time. Four little heads in a row. They're usually between two and four fathers per litter of pups. This indicates that females are mating with a number of males. It's only the second time we've... The results confirm Mena's hunch that females are deliberately hedging their bets by selecting several fathers for their offspring. It's 37.4. Must have a, chest, not really. a devil's life is short, and they only have three or four seasons to carry on the family line. This is another boy. <laughs> She's also finding that certain personality traits are passed on from one generation to the next. Okay. Uh, Female 259 is quiet and easy to handle, just like a mother. Oh, you're kidding, aren't you? You could turn around and just nail me, you know. Well, sometimes. <laughs> As dawn breaks, Manganini returns home, tired from a long hunting trip. Her pups are five months old and she now leaves them in the den. They've been sired by two strong fathers. The young male did get his chance. Good paternity gives him an advantage in the hard race ahead. They're vulnerable at this age and they have not yet learned about predators. But they must learn fast because their childhood is brief. It's crucial to practice the male fighting skills. Their warning systems are kicking in too. It's safer inside. For high above them, danger lurks in an unsuspected form. A nest of spotted tail quolls. One of the young devils would make an easy meal for them. Quolls can rear six young, compared to the devil's four, and they too have a number of fathers for each litter. The agile young quolls are already starting to hunt alone. Like quolls, 
The young devils must learn basic survival skills at an early age, and Manganini gives them a bit of schooling. She's not taking them on a hunting trip. Her pouch is no longer big enough to hold them. But it's no joyride either. She's encouraging them to venture further from the den. They must become familiar with the home range so that they can find their own food. This is where they get a drink. And this is a tricky bit. He's not meant to fall in. It's all right, mother's got him. All in a day's lesson. Devils and humans may be getting on better these days, but the relationship is still sometimes strained. A local devil expert has been called out to a farmhouse to investigate some unwanted tenants. Sounds like they're coming out of the bowels of hell. Yes. That's why they're called devils. That's a good name. Honestly, <laughs> it sounds awful. It's not like a possum. I heard some awful noises and I uh, came out with a torch and a stone to, and I thought it was a couple of possums fighting. And I shone the torch in the, uh, the hole there, as you see, and out popped a little black head. Okay. Let's have a look. Perfect sort of place for a devil to hide under a house, isn't it? You see anything? It's a young one's plane. The mum goes out at night. They're big enough now, they're weaning. And so they're more noisy. Yep. And this is the spare room. If we keep this locked up, you can smell that. Uh... Yeah, right. That... It smells like carrion. So that, and that's just above the hole, isn't that's it? Right. That's the entrance. Yeah, room. they've got the full run of the place, really. Yeah. We heard in, in Jack's bedroom. Yeah, so all under. Oh, right under the house. But that sounds like they're big. It was just like they were. There was a builder under the floor. Yeah, it was just going bang. <laughs> builder. Bang, under. you know, they're big, meaty creatures. Almost felt like I could feel them. Feel them under the floor. Feel it. Yeah. yeah. The sparsely populated island stands in the path of the westerly gales. And spring rains drench Manganini's home range. But she must continue to hunt each night. Nothing can dampen her sense of smell. Never mind if the flesh is rotting, a devil's stomach can cope with anything. Maybe this will keep the boys quiet. The pups must learn to tear a carcass apart. The size of teeth and jaws determines what size prey a carnivore will eat. And even young devils are very well endowed in the dental department. When they've had their fill, it's time for a scrap. And a bit more exploring. At seven months, the boys are now venturing as far as half a kilometre from the den and are learning to hunt for themselves. They'll pick up lizards and insects and look for nooks and crannies that can provide shelter. At this age, they are at grave risk from other predators, including adult devils. Death can also come from above. The wedge-tailed eagle is the largest bird of prey in Tasmania. With its powerful talons, it can easily take a devil. But the greatest danger doesn't come from the sky. In 1995, Mena Jones became aware of a devastating new threat to Tasmanian devils. A killer disease was spreading across the island. Soon, it was being recorded in epidemic proportions. 
the devil population plummeted. It's all her lower jaw. Poor little thing. I can smell it from here. It really stinks. Oh, come on, go. Oh, that looks awful. There we go. Open your mouth. Just look at that. She has three tumours, or three lumps. This big one here, two and a half months ago in April, that was about one and a half centimetre diameter. She has one in the roof of the mouth, which is only, it's about doubled in size since April. And she has a new one on this side of the mouth. That's quite small. The disease is a cancer of the lymphatic system that causes massive tumours to grow Eventually they spread throughout the body and the devil becomes very thin and it dies, usually within four to six months. We think it's caused by a virus and probably spread by devils biting each other. The adult male devils become infected first and then it spreads to the adult females and lastly to the juveniles. Scientists think the disease could be a virus living in the devil's DNA. Or it could be caused by the use of chemicals in the environment, such as pesticides or fertilizers. We simply don't know. So far, a third of the population of devils have disappeared. As yet, there is no cure. Should devils be wiped out in the wild, one source of breeding stock may be the animals at Trawana Wildlife Park, where Andrew Kelly has been breeding them for 20 years. Hey, settle down. I wasn't demanding you to show the young, I was just fixing up your belly. But I can see, look, I can see them. I can see their little tails and feet. Let's have a look. Oh. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? 16 weeks later, they've grown from a little thing that doesn't even look like a baby animal to what you see there. By raising orphan devils and breeding from them, Andrew maintains a broad base of genetic diversity in his captive population. So far, none of his devils have shown signs of the disease. Summer returns to the wilderness forest. Manganini has not been back to her den for several weeks. At eight months, each young male is now fending for himself. It's time for him to strike out into the unknown. He must find a home far beyond the range of his mother. Along the way, he will come across many strange sights. Even giants don't frighten him. He's a Tasmanian devil. But this is a more dangerous beast. Roadkill wallaby makes an easy meal, but there's sometimes a price. Not even a devil can stare down a mechanical monster. Over the next two years, every other male he meets will challenge him. This will test whether Manganini made a good choice when she selected his father. He has the size and strength to win. He proves he's a survivor. Now he's ready to mate. Soon another generation is finding its way. Manganini's grandchild is a living reflection of the rugged wilderness of Tasmania. It's tough, it's a survivor, and it's the last of its kind on Earth.
Tasmanian Devils. They can devour an entire horse overnight, eating everything but the iron shoes. It sounds like they're coming out of the bowels of hell. Yes. That's why they're called devils. Devils have fascinated scientists for hundreds of years. <laughs> they just get in bad moods sometimes. Nothing you can do about it. You can't talk them around. <laughs> the wilderness forest of Tasmania shelter the last remaining populations of Tasmanian devils, the largest marsupial hunters alive today. A four-year-old female devil comes out of her den. Her name is Manganini. Her life will be short. Like the kangaroo, she has a pouch. But unlike it, she's a hunter. And the ruse know it. She tests the response of a kangaroo. She's looking for the sick and the weak. The devil's a meat eater, a scavenger with an extraordinary sense of smell. They are solitary animals, except when the neighbourhood gathers to share food. She can smell a carcass from far off. Their Latin name, Sarcophilus, means flesh lover. With jaws like hydraulic presses, they leave nothing behind. Forged on kangaroo, Manganini returns to her den. It's only weeks since her last litter left home, and already it's time to mate again. A young male gets a whiff of the telltale scent she's giving off. But he knows he's not the only one around. The big man of the area has got there first. He's stronger and more experienced. And he'll be the first caller. He's been here before. He fathered some of Manganini's pups last season. The hormone-driven teenager can't help himself. Female scent is overpowering. He creeps in, even though he knows the bedroom is occupied. to 14 kilos. Scarred faces tell of previous battles. This time the big fellow drives the youngster off. It takes enormous energy and even the victor will lose a quarter of his body weight during the mating season and the fighting is only part of it. Manganini comes out to see who's won. She knows that smell, as she thought, Mr. Big. His size and age proves he's a survivor and of good stock. But is he still up to it? Now he has to prove himself by overcoming the female as well. It's another test to see if he's fit to sire her pups. 
but it's a surprisingly tender ritual. Manganini could drive him off if she wanted to, and at other times of the year she would. But she's ready, and he's affectionate, and experienced. Not like some of the youngsters. He grabs her by a curious swelling on the back of her neck. She's been building this up for several weeks, just for this purpose. Now it becomes a fleshy handle by which he can drag her, caveman style, to the den. Inside, the wrestling continues until Manganini relaxes. The male will keep her imprisoned here for several days, mating many times and for hours on end. His aim is to secure his paternity by flooding her with sperm. Her aim is to get away and mate with other males. Manganini waits her chance. She tries to get away. The young male can hear what's happening inside. He might still have a chance. Finally, she escapes. Beyond the wilderness and far from Manganini's mountain retreat, the secrets behind the way Tasmanian devils breed are gradually being revealed by an ingenious experiment. Trawana Wildlife Park holds the largest population of captive devils in the world. Biologist Mena Jones has been studying devils and other carnivorous mammals for almost two decades. She's investigating the mysteries of how female devils choose a mate. This is just lovely down here. Everywhere you look, there's a, there's a face grumbling. <laughs> She's actually quiet enough just to hold. The captive devils are coming into season, and Mena checks their breeding state for her experiments. As they get closer to coming into season, they start to produce a pink sort of wax in the pouch, and this builds up into a red, oily secretion. Stop it. Look at that. Here's another girl. Men has constructed three interconnected pens holding two males and a female. The female is fitted with a magnetic key that allows her to enter either of the male zones, but the males can't get to her. She has to choose. You're a bit nice devil in the thinner. She's just running around exploring the enclosure. Kimberly, the female, has the centre pen all to herself. The pen on the right contains Murchison, an older male, and on the left is a young devil, Mac. Mac is excited by the prospect. Kimberly checks out the talent. Mac is not quite sure how to proceed. He's frightened of her. And he's not wrong. But he gives it a shot anyway. The kid just doesn't know what he's supposed to do. The female is totally in control of the situation. Kimberly gives up in disgust and goes home. She tries the other side. That's more like it. When the male grabs her and subdues her, she can choose to fight or she can choose to be dragged. And very often she will just lie down and almost invite the male to drag her along the ground. 
That was a real classic because he dragged her on her side for a full two metres and that's about the furthest I've ever seen him dragged. What I found out was that females actually like to mate with older devils and with bigger devils. Bigger devils are, are stronger, they're fitter, they're more dominant and um, older devils have more experience. They've got to be smarter if they've managed to get to that age. There must be something about that feeling of being dominated by the male that makes the females go very placid. They must like it. <laughs> in captivity, Murchison's fatherhood is unchallenged. But in the wild, Mena thinks that females may store sperm from several males before the eggs are fertilised. It's the female's way of upping her chances of having at least one strong offspring. Autumn in the Tasmanian wilderness, and Manganini gathers nesting material. It's only ten days since Manganini conceived, but already it's time to get the den in order. As the time of birth approaches, she anxiously tries to find the right position. Eventually, she braces herself firmly, with her head down, a critical position if the birth is to be successful. Contractions begin and she starts to push. Finally, drops of thick fluid begin to emerge, forming silver trails along her fur and leading to the pouch. She's in an almost trance-like state, and this helps her stay in position. The fluid becomes a thin stream of mucus. And within this stream are the tiny living babies, each no bigger than a grain of rice. Each will struggle to climb back up the liquid column to reach the mother's fur. She gives birth to up to 40 of these tiny creatures. An incredibly difficult climb, then a struggle through a forest of hares. The goal is to reach one of the teats in the pouch. It's a life and death race. Because there are only four teats, only four babies can survive. In Manganini's case, only three make it. All are boys. They grow quickly. 30 days later, her boys have developed fine sets of whiskers and their noses start to change colour. Teeth and claws are coming along nicely too. but the pouch is getting a bit crowded. With the three pups tucked away on board, Manganini plods off on a nocturnal 